Well, welcome everybody to our State of Real Estate. Um, this is our second one for this year and uh, super excited that it, we have gotten through the first quarter of 2021. Um, if you guys don't know, uh, we have gotten, I don't know, six to eight inches of snow today. I thought with the ski resorts closing uh, this weekend, we were done with seeing snowflakes, but that is not the case. So crazy, crazy times that we're in, not just with real estate, but with weather. Uh, we have a fun packed episode for you guys. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, mute yourselves, but feel free to open up your chat box. Um, we will be answering questions throughout the presentation. And uh, we will also be recording this. So if there's anything that you miss or something that you wanna go back to, we will be sending it in our news update uh, for the month. Um, and I would love to kick off the state of real estate by introducing our guest speaker, Cody Beal from Cody Beal Interior Designs. Cody graduated from Utah State University and has professionally designed uh, projects in Park City, San Diego, and New York. And he also um, designed our office here in Park City, our Coldwell Banker office. So for those of you that have seen our office, you have seen his uh, wonderful design style. Well, we're very excited to have him with us today. And without further ado, Cody Beal. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? I wanna make sure I'll work on the lighting. It's a little dark, I know, but um, thank you for having me as a speaker today. I'm excited to talk to you all about some color trends that I'm seeing out there. Um, it's been a very unusual year for us. Um, in the design world as well. But what we've seen is an uptick. And I'm sure that's why um, all of you have seen, noticed this as well as everybody is home, they're looking around, they wanna have um, the best interior that they can, the best space that they can, or if they're selling, um, as we know, um, they're not putting much into that, but people that are buying want to really improve. Uh, I just returned from Las Vegas market, which is easy for us to get to saw a lot of different trends and colors that I wanted to talk about, but um, we're seeing a, a return back to more earth tones. Um, and one of the biggest things you could do for your space is probably paint for, for the money to change the look is a paint and color change. And um, I would say for probably the last five plus years, we've seen a strong trend in gray and white as everybody has noticed, white cabinets, white, gray and white has been very strong on the palette. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend a market in Germany in 2019 and saw some colors there that was interesting. And they've continued to um, come our direction. And that's, we're seeing a big shift away from gray and we're seeing it move more into bronze, lots softer, more earth tones, a um, uh, lot more, of the golds, the blues, the greens, jewel tones, but things are softening up a little bit and people are looking back to not quite traditional. We're still in a transition, but they're, they're looking to move away from a little bit of the sterileness of a clean, modern look into something that's more home, wood and friendly and warm. So I, I brought a couple of things to show you what I'm talking about. Um, these are some just quick fabric poles can you guys see this? So we're seeing a turn to the ochres, kind of the navy greens. These are the jewel tones that are coming in. And for wall colors, we're seeing a lot of accents in those tones come back and, and be really part of the interior. Um, one of the things that I see uh, in color forecasting is it is all over the map. So if you look for guidance to the, to the internet, each paint company has kind of staked their claim on some color scheme and they're selling that. And I see a lot of that in the market. So there is a little bit of a transition going on right now in terms of interiors and what's trendy and what's, what's in. But what I do see these colors as being the, the, uh, the color palette that will stay through the trends and have a little more staying power. Um, 
and please feel free to um, ask questions as I'm going along. So if anybody has questions, you can unmute yourself and talk. Um, right now, I feel like Sherwin Williams is one of the stronger pallets out there and products. Um, I walked in and picked this pamphlet up. It's probably the first time I've done this in 20 years and said, oh, I could work with every color on this palette. And you can go to your local Sherwin Williams store. This one's called Minimal and Modern. If they put my name on this, it would be okay. But here's, I know we're on the computer, but it's just a really nice, very easy on the eyes palette that would go with a lot in the market. So that, that's available at your local Sherwood Williams store. And then um, just a color sample of, color is so bad on the computer, but this is like a bronze. We're seeing a move away from the harsh black. But then we're still seeing some presence of gold metals, silver metals, black metals being mixed with the bronzes. So there's your color trend update. Do you, um, does anybody have any questions? Cody, in the chat box, it says, where do most of the color trends start? Oh, that's a really good question. There is, um, there is such a thing as a color council and color is very much tied to the marketing world and the color council meets and it has representatives from every industry and they do color forecasting and they also help select the colors of the years. So it is no coincidence what you're seeing in fashion um, is where it starts first. So fashion first, and then about two years, it comes into the interior world in terms of what has staying ability. So it starts with the color um, council, goes into fashion, and what is successful in fashion then comes to home interiors. So does that answer your question, Lana? Yeah, that is actually yeah. quite interesting. I have never- It's very known. interesting. And we will see Europeans are a little more um, adventurous when it comes to exploring with color. Um, and, and that's why I visited that area. And I see a lot of, you know, uh, it, it is a lot more jewel tones. It's deeper. There was hardly anything gray. Everything was green or this ochre color or emerald. It all had a deep saturation, very moody, very, very comforting. Um, and it was, it, 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 there were solid colors. There's not a lot of pattern being used. So let's see, Rob asked, do you think gray floors, wood looking are going to be out of date soon? Um, that is a really good question. It depends on the shade of gray. I would say darker, the better Rob. Um, the lighter I do think is a little bit trendy. I always uh, uh, tell my clients um, and give them counsel to take, do it as natural as you can. So if you're using oak, go with a blonde oak. If you're going with walnut, try to keep it a blonde, you know, just a, a natural color. And that those have a little bit more staying powers, but I do think the gray floors and the gray cabinets, I think that is on its way out. All right, does anybody else have questions? Awesome, Cody, thank you so much for that sneak thank peek. Thank you. These trends. Um, yeah. Definitely interesting to get a professional's take because, you know, we go to the, the paint store and <laughs> you never know what I'm going home with. <laughs> yeah, I believe my information was shared in the chat. So if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me and I appreciate being invited to speak and hopefully I'll be back to speak to you guys again. Perfect. Thanks, Cody. Okay, yeah. take care. Now I get the pleasure of introducing the newest development in Deer Valley, uh, Stein Erickson Estates. Thank you. 
So for those of you that are actually very uh, familiar with uh, Deer Valley, this is Mid Mountain. It's a couple of minute drive from the Stein Erickson Lodge. Um, they have decided uh, to partner uh, this new development, which is a gated community of 15 legendary uh, custom home lots with Stein Erickson. So you get uh, the Stein Erickson amenities, but you are not, you know, attached to the Stein Erickson Lodge. These are lots that average between 0.54 acres and go up to three acres. Just like I said, a couple of minutes from Stein Erickson Lodge. This is the former Huntsman uh, development that was a little bit further down. So looking at this plat map, uh, you can see all of the lots. So there's 15 total lots on the right hand side where it kind of looks like there's several little streets over there. That is the Huntsman Estates. So they're going to have this as a gated community on right off of Royal Street. Um, but you will have access to the uh, five-star full amenity package up at the Stein Erickson Lodge. So as you saw on the video, um, you have the fitness center. It will be ski in, ski out, even though it's not direct access from the lot. Uh, they will have a shuttle that will take you up to the ski in, ski out. Um, they have the theater, the spa services, uh, the Champion Club Entertainment Center. Um, so all of these great amenities at your fingertips with the price of the lot. So there's no additional fees uh, to be a member at the Stein Lodge. It is already part of the price. Um, if you're looking at the plat map and you're looking at lot eight, nine, 10, and 11, those really have uh, phenomenal views of Jupiter Peak and also of uh, historic Park City. So pretty unique lots. Lot two and lot three are the two largest lots um, being the approximate three acres. Uh, so a lot of privacy with great views. Most of the lots are also downhill, easy built. So if you guys have more questions or like more information, please reach out to us. We would love to take you up there and uh, show you those properties. And next, uh, we have Todd Schlopey discussing the top rated golf communities in the Park City area. Take it away, Todd. Thanks, Lana. Um, I know the calendar says that spring arrives on March 21st, but I've been around Park City a long time. And in Park City, spring starts when we say it starts, and that's the end of the ski season. Notwithstanding the foot of snow that got dumped on us today, it's time to turn our attention to all the other things we love to do here in the mountains, like biking, hiking, tennis, and golf. I'm sure we've all been following what's been happening with pricing and the interest in our area and in the local real estate market. We thought it would be timely to look at our golf course communities and clubs. When I came to Park City in the late 1980s, there weren't really any houses on Park Meadows and Jeremy Ranch, and they were the two games in town. This particular shot, I've been up in a balloon a couple times. I was smart enough to take a camera. That's the 17th hole looking out towards the 10th hole at Park Meadows in the distance and not a house to be seen. Obviously, that's vastly different now. My first house was actually in Park Meadows in what they call Park Meadows 5 across the street from the fifth hole. And it cost 105,000, and they were made a point of telling me that included the dishwasher, the uh, refrigerator, uh, washer, and dryer. And times obviously have really changed. 
Um, our area is now home to many truly great golf courses designed by some of the finest golf course architects in the world. So let's take a look at what it takes to belong and play here. Since we're already talking about Park Meadows, which is a Jack Nicholas course uh, early on in his career in a very classic design, the initiation fee currently at Park Meadows is $115,000 and $1,170 a month dues. Park Meadows uh, has 325 members. They also have social memberships and they currently have a wait list uh, for both golf and social memberships. Their amenities include a pool, gym, dining, pickleball, uh, virtual golf. Moving on to Jeremy Ranch. Jeremy Ranch has uh, some of the easier fees in the area and that you can get an initiation fee there for $5,000. Uh, their dues are about 690 a month and it's very a la carte. Uh, it's, it was born as pretty much a golf course. There isn't a lot there in terms of amenities. They allow cross country skiing out there in the winter. Um, they've got a small gym, they have a good dining room. Uh, and, that, and that's an Arnold Palmer course, of course, and a, a great golf course that we're lucky to have here. Moving out to Glenwild, a gated community and a Tom Fazio design. Um, Initiation fees out in Glenwild, we're looking at $125,000 currently. And these are all moving targets. Um, we get the best data that we can, but uh, just like with our real estate market, things here change almost on a daily basis. Uh, monthly fees are about $1,500 a month. Great amenities out at Glenwild, pool, fitness, dining, pickleball, spa, tennis, cross country, and on and on. Moving over to Promontory, where they have two 18-hole golf courses, one by Jack Nicklaus, one by Pete Dye, $150,000 initiation fee. They may get some subsidies with purchases in there. Uh, $1,800 a month dues, 750 members. Uh, there is a wait list right now for their golf memberships. Pool, tennis, six dining rooms, bowling alley, equestrian, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of great things to do in Promontory. Tuahay, a Marco Mira course over in Hideout, $100,000 initiation fee. Uh, that initiation fee we understand now is required with all new sales. So you can't go in there uh, without becoming a member of the golf club. $1,425 a month in dues. The HOA dues, if you, for some reason, were to find a property in there that didn't have a golf membership with it, the HOA dues don't get you access to any of their amenities, and their amenities in there are considerable. Pool, fitness, spa, tennis, more. Tua Hay is loaded on amenities. Moving a little bit further out to Victory Ranch in Camas, you have a great Reese Jones design course out there with $110,000 initiation fees, Membership is restricted to homeowners only, and it is required when you move in there. $1,150 a month, 375 members right now out of a total amount of 420 that they're looking for. When they reach at this point, one more membership at 376, the owners are gonna, the, uh, the homeowners are gonna take ownership of the club. They have a pool, a gym, a number of dining rooms, spa, fishing, skeet, uh, four by four UTV and ATV trails, equestrian, biking, archery, tons of stuff to do out at Victory Ranch, really great spot. And then out into Heber at Red Ledges, another Jack Nicholas design course with current initiation fees of $95,000. Uh, golf memberships are not available on all lots. So you need a little bit of help negotiating that when you go into Red Ledges. Fees are $850 a month, which covers your social membership. Uh, they also have a separate social membership if you don't want the golf. But when you do join their golf course, you have access to a great little par three course, which is a lot of fun. Two pools right now, I think another one under construction if it's not uh, ready to open already. 
gym, dining, tennis, pickleball. Uh, great, great spot out there at Red Ledges. Our data guru, Eric Schlopey, and I like to run some ratios on land costs versus sold home prices just to see where there are opportunities in the market. Um, in an older downtown area like Park Meadows, where there are zero lots available, and same out in Jeremy Ranch, there's no lots available right now. Um, you're either buying and living in the house as it is, you're remodeling, or you're tearing down the house and rebuilding, in which case you're buying the house for the land. Um, my little $105,000 house that I mentioned earlier uh, sold a couple of years ago for $1.25 million. They knocked it down to the foundation. Um, for that reason, ratios in an area like Park Meadows, for example, are 50% uh, of what we would call the sold land price versus the average sales price of a home. In Jeremy Ranch, Promontory, Tuahay, and Victory, that ratio is about 25%. Glen Wild and Red, Red Ledges uh, check in at about 17%, meaning that if you can find the right parcel in there and build efficiently, there is value to be had. Uh, the days of giving golf memberships away or buying them on ksl.com are long gone. Our local clubs are healthy, they're in demand. And even though it's tougher, you can still find a great golf community in our mountain paradise. We're here to help you navigate the hazards. Forgive me for the pun, but uh, give us a call. We'll set up a meeting on the first tee. Okay, now I can start talking. Sorry, guys. Uh, what a great presentation, Todd. I, that is so interesting to hear that. And I know which golf community I would be uh, seeking out if I was in that market. Uh, now let's turn to the uh, stats. Um, Eric usually takes us on like Todd said, but I'm going to try to uh, do the best that I can and give you some great information. Um, so on this first slide, uh, number of closed sales. So we are looking at quarter one of this year, so of 2021 against quarter uh, one of 2020. And if you look in the right-hand corner, you see 925 sales we had in quarter one of this year. Um, that is a 69% increase over the same quarter as last year. The one um, number that I really want to point out is if you look at the, the lines, uh, land, which is the second highest, is actually for quarter one, the 325 sales, which is 34% of the sales in quarter one were land sales which is pretty astonishing because if you look at the trends, I mean, single family was by far exceeding all other sales uh, throughout the year um, until this first quarter of 2021. So with that said, let's go to the next slide and look at days on market, which is also a, another very interesting statistic. So quarter one of this year, uh, average days on market is 13. As last year, the average days on market were 45 for the same quarter. So that is actually down by 70%. And that's the only downtrend that you're gonna see in my, my slides, which is a positive for a, a seller um, to have you know, the demand in the market. So if you look at the land sales, uh, in quarter one of 2019, the average days on market were 147. And then that gap got pretty small. And then it got a little bit bigger in quarter three of uh, 2020. So just six months ago, average days on market for land was 109 days. Now you look at today for quarter one of 2021, the average days on market was only 28 days. Um, that's just showing you how much demand uh, people are looking for in land so they can build their custom home. Um, and then when you look at the next slide, uh, dollar per square foot. So now we're going into 
uh, residential properties and they're split out by townhome, condo, and also single family. So average uh, dollar per square foot for quarter one of this year was $520 um, up against last year uh, at $351 per square foot with an increase of over 48%, which is quite remarkable. Um, again, on that same note of uh, buyer demand and not having a lot that's on the, on the market. So looking at um, the pink identified, that's gonna be the single family home trends. So last year on the same quarter, average dollar per square foot was $279. And this quarter, uh, equal quarter, but this year, uh, $427 a square foot. That is an amazing increase of 34%. Now, when you're looking at each one of these lines, you can see condos have always been trending higher dollar per square foot than single family homes and or townhomes. And that has to do with the uh, condos typically are smaller in square foot. So the curve, uh, the smaller the property, the higher the dollar per square foot, the larger the property, the smaller dollar per square foot. So when we're using dollar per square foot, whether we're representing a seller or representing a buyer, um, you always wanna keep it in comparison to the trends of that specific type of property. So condos versus condos, townhomes versus townhomes, you're not gonna wanna take the average of all of them at the $520 and try to price out a condo, you'll probably underprice it. So uh, keep that in mind as you're, you know, uh, looking at stats and presenting offers or receiving offers. On the next slide uh, is the average sold price. So if you're looking at the box in the yellow on the right, uh, quarter one of this year, so 2021, um, the average single or the average price for a home uh, was 1,352,000. Last year and the same quarter, the average sale price uh, was 995,000. I would like to identify the top line that you see to the left that you see in the pink. So in quarter one of 2020, the average single family home price was 1,373,000, which was pretty close in line to what all of the sales were uh, in all categories for this quarter. But when you look separately at the single family home line, it has increased over, where's my number? Uh, almost 995,000 uh, from last year, same quarter to this year, same quarter. So on average, your single family home that you're purchasing in this market is uh, $2,351,000 with an increase of 41%. So definitely a seller's market that we're in. And, um, you know, looking at these trends, uh, the next, thing I have is a, a fun little fact. So I checked the MLS this morning. There are a total of seven homes that are for sale that are under $1.5 million in Park City. Out of those seven, uh, one of them is priced under a million dollars. And that is an 1,800 square foot single family home um, listed at 875,000, uh, already has, I don't know, when I spoke to the agent earlier, had like 50 requests to see the property. Uh, they're not going to look at any offers until, uh, the weekend and probably make a decision on Monday, but the supply and demand is just absolutely crazy. So the dollar per square foot on that home is $757. So that's just supply and demand.
Lana, when you say the seven homes, though, this is Pamela, by the way. Yep. I'm assuming you're talking Park City proper instead of the Summit County area. So it actually is Park City as a whole. So Snyderville Basin and also Park City proper. Okay. Does that clarify it? It does. Thank you. Yeah. So another uh, fun fact, um, I did a search for homes that have sold over $10 million. So in the last 10 years, 48 homes have sold over $10 million. In the last year, uh, out of the 48 total sold, 21 were in the last year. So 56% of the $10 million homes were sold in the last year. Pretty crazy. So that uh, concludes my stats. Um, now for something a little bit more fun. Uh, looking back, uh, we're gonna take a look at the good old days. <laughs> All right, so I guess, I think you know who those young people were way back then. So I have a story. Um, two very, very young gentlemen from the University of Utah branding <laughs> our team Shlopi uh, through social media took Mary <laughs> Francis and myself to lunch. And uh, while we were having our discussions, they asked when I moved to town and I said, oh, it was 1992. And they looked at me and they said, oh, what, what, how was it way back then? And I was like, oh my God, they must think I'm back in the middle ages. Anyway, I talked about that. And I said, well, when we moved here in 1992, there were three stoplights after you got off the 80 to get into town. Now we know there's a lot more. I believe I counted 16. There was nothing at the junction except McDonald's. And then in 1997, when Kent and I purchased the house in Ranch Place, which of course you know is out towards the junction, everyone said, oh my gosh, you're gonna live way out there. So yes, everything has changed. So let's just talk about the history of our tickets, our, our ski tickets. Um, when Snow Park Ski Area, and they actually were around in 1946, which is now the Park City Mountain Resort, it was $1.50 a day was what the day pass cost. Treasure Mountain Ski Area, which was Park City Ski Resort, in 1963, it was $3.50 a day. Now, Deer Valley opened in 1981. I couldn't find any stats on that. I think they, they hit it for how much the prices were. But I did find in 1979, the tickets for Vail were $10 and the tickets for Aspen were a whopping $16. Then, in 1985, when we coined the greatest snow on earth, our passes have gone up and up and up to enjoy the greatest snow on earth. Um, Deer Valley ski passes are $2,500 um, and they're staying the same. However, the um, older, the mature generation, 65 and older, our, I'll admit it, Kent and I, our tickets were uh, $1,150 this past year. They're going up to $1,920 next year. So we think they're taking the algorithms and figuring out how many times we ski and they can make more money on the 65 plus. So there you have it. It's not good, you know, it's, it's interesting statistics. Um, also, if you wanna ski free, you have to be 75 years old um, to ski free in snow basin and 80 years old in Alta. All right, so I'm closing with an icon that is closing. This, these are photographs from a restaurant that's been in business since 1977. All of you locals know it's Adolph's. We're so sad he's closing the end of this month. Um, it's where the locals hung out. A lot of the old timers would hang out at the bar and we dubbed it the wrinkle bar. So I don't know where the wrinkle bar is gonna end up, but, or the, all these pictures, actually I do know he's going to run 
and auction in mid-May if you're interested. A lot of these pictures will be auctioned off. So thank you for tuning in, everybody. I think, oh, uh, the one question, Lana, uh, Steve Rule asked is, um, what is the average square foot price um, of a home, a single family home in yes. this market? Uh, Mary that? Francis, can you go back to the dollar per square foot? So for a single family home in this market, and this is, uh, these stats are coming directly off of the Park City um, MLS. So $427 is the average, but that is going to include Park City along with Camas, along with Heber. Um, if you're looking for Park City, say Snyder, Snyderville Basin, I can do that separate and I can get that answer to you. So just let me know what you, you would like. All right, I think that's it. You guys, you are uh, all been great. You're wonderful people to um, have business with. We appreciate it. And uh, we have these every quarter. <laughs> Todd, what are you flashing up there? You're on mute. Todd and yep. oh, and Adolf. Yes. Oh, cool. Yes. Marnie. Yes. It's Pamela again. So I, I am interested in the original question is what is the average square foot of right. a home? Not the price per square footage, but the actual square footage itself. Say so what what's the question again, Pamela? What do you want to know? So I think the question that Steve asked and that I'm interested in as well is what is the average square footage, not necessarily the price per square foot. Oh, what is the average square foot of a house in Park City proper? I think that was the question, right, Steve? I think he wanted to know the price, but I'm not sure. But okay. you know, Pamela, that's kind of hard because how do you how do you do that when you've got the colony and you've got Deercrest? Yeah. And then you've got um you know, homes that are smaller, you know, in the, in the yep. other areas in uh, Snyderville, uh, uh, not Silver Springs, but the, the one next to Silver Springs that have the smaller square footage. So it's hard to say what an average square foot um, home runs. Kent, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, are we seeing them get bigger? Or are we seeing them start to come down into a normal size? I mean, are we well, still uh, square foot? I'll I'll answer that, Pamela, and then Kent, you can join in what you think. But, you know, we saw a trend for smaller square footage for a while because people didn't want the upkeep, they didn't want the heating, they didn't want all of the, the stuff that goes with a larger home. But with COVID, it's reversed because mm -hmm. now people want two offices, they want a place for the children to do their homework. That, that has reversed itself and we're seeing bigger square footage now that, that people do want. Okay, thanks, yeah. Marnie. Can Pamela, yeah. we, we could do it by uh, market area if you really want it. No, I was just curious, Kent, if, if, if you guys had that at the, at the top of your brain, it'd be an interesting conversation That's watching the size of homes, right, in this community. 5,000 to 6,000 feet might be the average across all of our markets. Yeah. Okay. Pamela, I can, I can tell you, that when a builder gives a price per square foot now, they mm -hmm. go on a 6,000 square foot home. Okay, and the there reason you go. is, the reason is obviously the smaller the home, the more expensive. And then when you get up to much bigger homes, then you have extra kitchens and spas. And so then that becomes more expensive too. So the builders will quote uh, on a square foot basis, if you're building a 6,000 square foot home. That's interesting. Thanks, Marnie. Sure. Steve, do you want to unmute what and clarify what question you were asking? Can you hear me? Can you hear we can. You can? Yes. Okay. I, I just was was you know curious because we were talking about the average square foot price. And, and so just understanding what the single family home average square footage would look like, 
um, you know, in, in, in that, in that market area, you know, with, with that price of what I think it was 427. So Steve, I'm trying to do that stat and it's telling me that I have too big of a pool of uh, properties. So <laughs> let me um, see if I can narrow my search a little bit. Let me see if I can do 90 days closed. You know, right now, it's something that you just want to, you know, kind of boil out and, and kick around and, and get back to me email, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I will send it to you, Steve, and also you, Pamela. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lana. Thank you, guys. Hey, Lana, it's Jeff Jensen. One more thing before we we end. Will you, will you um, I, I just sent Marnie an email, but will you send over a copy of the presentation? Yeah, so if you didn't uh, hear the beginning of it, we are filming this, so we will have it in a link, but our specific slides, I can send you to you separately as well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, have a nice evening. Enjoy the spring yeah. when it gets here. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Snowbird tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Bye-bye. Good job, group. Bye. Bye-bye.